Hello YouTube, Budget Nerd here again with another network walkthrough. This network I put together for my friend and his new vet clinic. It's not exactly budget and doesn't necessarily fall in line with my normal focus on tech around the home. But I figured it was too good to pass up. And it's sort of a souped up version of my original do-it-yourself budget home network video, link in the description by the way. The point of this video is to show you how the network was planned, what was set up, how it was done, and how to connect everything so you could appropriately scale it to your needs and do your own. I'm not going to go into immense detail on everything, but you will be able to see it come together from start to finish. So first I met with the owner of the building and talked with him about his needs, what he was going to do, how many PCs or other connected devices he would have, how many wireless devices, did he want to have Wi-Fi for his guests? Was he going to have IP-based surveillance? What would be his needs in one year, five years, ten years from now? Before drywall goes up is the perfect time to run these cables. They all ran to this one location where the rack and his other equipment would go. Clearly, the idea for him was to get as many of his devices wired as he could. We also planned on getting him wireless access to this network as well. Once the cables were ran and the painting was done, I mounted the rack in pre-drilled holes, you can see here, with bolts, making sure I hit studs. I didn't want it coming down. I made sure to choose one that would have the space to grow with the business as well. I installed the rack mounted power strip which would supply power to anything on the rack that would need it such as a modem, a switch, router, etc. It had this cool cover for the power button. I felt just like a fighter pilot when I opened it. Well, sort of. The patch panels were next. A patch panel will allow a point to terminate the wires running through the wall. In my opinion, a patch panel is a must for any serious network setup and was a must for this project. For more detail on patch panels, you can check out my what is a patch panel and do you need one video. Link also in the description. Next was the rack mounted cable management panel. This will help manage and keep any cables coming from the patch panels to the switch somewhat orderly. Lastly, the switch, which is a TP-Link switch. It costs a little under $500 and it is a 48 port PoE plus managed switch. Pretty overkill for a home setup but it will provide the power and the manageability that a small to medium sized office could benefit from. Next I terminated all wall jacks around the place. Each wall plate would have two ethernet jacks. In this project and any that I do I will use the B standard for punching down ethernet wires. There's also an A standard but B is commonly the most used. So at this point came the part of the project that is the least fun for me. Punching down the patch panel. I'm not going to go into immense detail on how to punch down a patch panel but I will show some things though. So first I began to organize the cables coming out of the wall and bunching them into two neat groups. I used Velcro to hold them tightly together so they would look pretty presentable. Neatness is always a big thing for me. The bunch on the right happened to have 47 cables so those I would punch down on the top patch panel. The 48th slot I will run to the router, more on that later. The bunch on the left had about 29 if I recall and I ran this to the bottom patch panel. Punching down the cables isn't hard if you have the right tools, a cable stripper, punch down tool, etc. But it can be tedious. This rack has some access on the sides and is great for punching down a few cable runs later but when doing 76 ethernet cables at once, it's not ideal. I ended up flipping the patch panel over and bringing the cables over the top to punch them down. This totally works and it's a trick I got from someone who's been doing this all her life. Anyway, once done, carefully flip it back the way it should be. A few tips though, if you do this, give yourself enough slack so you do not have any issues when rotating it the way it should go. Also think about how you are routing the cables and punching them down with the patch panel flipped so you don't find it impossible to get the patch panel where it needs to go when you're done. Patch panels will have the same two punch down options, A or B, and a color-coded label will show you what order to punch the wires down in. Just be sure to use the same standard you used when punching down the keystones. 
These worked great and look nice. The back looks okay. I don't have a ton of experience punching down this much at once. But I was figuring out how to make it a little prettier as I went along. With this, your basic cable structure is done. Now we have a lot of wall plates around the place and no knowledge of what number they go to on the patch panel. For this, you can use a multi-function tester with a toner to chase the cables. These are great to have when doing a project of this size. There are a few ways to identify the wall jacks without one or with cheaper ones, and I'll touch on that briefly later. The model I have for this is the Noyafa NF8601. Hopefully I said that right. This multifunction tool is a good budget option with lots of features for this sort of thing. I'll be doing a review and a detailed demonstration of what it can do in an upcoming video. The cable at this wall plate runs through the walls now and ultimately to the patch panel. It was terminated on one of the panels at a specific port and has a number and it's our current job now to find out which one it is and this is how I did it. Number one, plug in a good ethernet cable into the tester. Plug the other end of the ethernet cable to the ethernet port on the wall plate you wish to identify. Next, turn the tester on and go to the setting to send a tone. In my case, I select scan. Number three, grab the tone receiver. This device will detect the tone being sent through the cable and can help me find the location where it is terminated on the patch panel, or can at least get me pretty close. Turn it on, and for this one, I select Scan. I run it carefully across the patch panel. You don't want to damage the wires inside the jacks. When you get close to the location where it is terminated, you will hear the tone. 70% of the time I could tell which one it was, and the rest of the time I was off by one or two. This time it sounds like it's port 29. Next, once you think you have the port on the panel, plug in an Ethernet cable to the remote cable tester and the other end to the port on the patch panel where your tone receiver found the tone. Next, go back to your main tester unit at the wall plate and set it to test the cable. You do this for two reasons. One, to test if that is the port, and two, to make sure it is wired correctly. The option on this tester is called wire mapping. One of the nice things about a tester like this is it will show you a map of the cable and show you if a wire isn't terminated correctly or incorrectly wired. It's pretty cool. If the wire was wrong, I would simply start with re-terminating the wall plate keystone and then the patch panel if I needed to. If the test came back empty, open, failed, for example, depending on what your tester says, then that's probably not the port on the patch panel and you could retone it or try the ports next to the one you thought it was. Lastly, since this is the port and the connection is good, we can label it. Optionally, you could then place unterminated jacks, for example, into port 29 on the patch panel to help you know which ones you've already identified. This will help you identify future ports on the panel quicker, letting you know which ones to skip. I labeled this jack T29. The T is to differentiate between the top and bottom patch panels. You could number and label yours how you wish. If you don't have a tester like this, you can find cheaper ones that will at least let you test the cables once you identify them, like this one here. They're around $20 to $30. Plug an ethernet cable into the tester and then into the jack on the wall plate you wish to identify. Next, plug in an ethernet cable to the remote part of the tester and then to the port on the patch panel you wish to test. If that's not the one, you could plug it into the next one and test and so on until you find the one that does pass the test. Makes it harder to do, but it does work. Also, you could just use a laptop to test. Plug in the laptop to a wall plate and then run a cable from the switch to a port on the patch panel. Continue to move the cable from port to port on the patch panel until your laptop gets a wired connection to the network and then you would know what port it was on the patch panel then you could label the wall plate. So here is the process again quickly for the second port on that same wall plate I did. With the ethernet cable plugged into the proper port on the tester, plug in the other end into the ethernet jack on the wall plate you wish to locate on the patch panel, set it to send a tone, the option for me is scan, grab the tone receiver, set it accordingly, and carefully search the patch panel for a tone. This one sounded like port 14. 
Once you think you found it, plug in an Ethernet cable to the remote tester and the other end into the suspected port on the patch panel. Run back to the wall plate and test the cable. If it comes back good and shows it's wired correctly, you're good to go. Label that dude. This is best done with two people, if you can. Next, we can set up the remaining network items. The ISP installed the cable modem router access point combo unit. I recommended to my friend to get a separate router with better features and performance, but he wanted to try this one first. The coaxial cable from the street for the ISP goes into the modem router combo, and for this particular model, you would run an ethernet cable from one of the router's LAN ports to our rack mounted switch. This is what I'm using port one on the patch panel for. This allows a connection from the router to the switch to fit in with the rest of the cabling scheme and help keep the setup looking neat and professional. I have an ethernet cable that is coming from the router's LAN port going to the patch panel terminated at port one and a patch cable going from port one on the patch panel to the switch completing the connection. Next we will be setting up the wireless access point. I will be disabling the one that comes with the ISP combo unit and instead we'll be using the, the Ubiquiti Unify AC Pro wireless access point. I have already pre-configured this at home and I won't be going into that detail here but if you are interested in more info on this uh, access point I will be doing a separate review and feature detail of this as well in an upcoming video. Quick version is this thing is pretty nice. With a network setup like this, I can plug in the access point to any port in the building and go to the patch panel and activate that port and we're good. With the switch being PoE, the access point will get all the power it needs from the ethernet cable as well. This access point will also allow guest Wi-Fi with a landing page and terms to accept. The software that comes with this is also pretty awesome too and really lets you dive into nerd heaven and monitor performance, allow and disallow services manage multiple access points, create a physical layout or map of the access points for coverage, check usage of specific devices, and much more. All that is left here is to set up the PC equipment and activate their respective ports. So that is pretty much all I wanted to cover in this video. If you have any questions, ask it in the comments. If it was helpful, like it. Thanks for watching.